when it's a long passage, the print has to be smaller to be on one page. <laughs> so when I put the glasses on, you know it's a long one. This is from the book of Acts, continuing adventures of Paul and Silas, in this case, and kind of an oscillating progression of incarceration and freedom, back and forth with various characters in this story. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they'd given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for light and rushed in. He fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. So it's the reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Invite us to pray. Precious God, we thank you, first of all, for a little snapshot of the early church. A little bit of a picture how things were in the early days. Paul and Silas were passing the word. But we also know that it wasn't easy. There were times of conflict, struggle, and yet your spirit persevered in a way so as to bring liberation to all. Help us to internalize this story so that we too can search for that deepest freedom that is you. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. When Paul and Silas were fairly new to Europe still, barely unpacked, <coughs> still struggling, struggling to speak European. And by this point, they probably still didn't have many friends in this new continent, other than Lydia and her family that we met last week. So enter the slave girl, whom I'll call Claire, for Claire Foman. <laughs> Claire was one of those annoying people that not only sees things, she says things. In a stage voice, she declares, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. 
And frankly, for Paul the Apostle, the Christian missionary to the Western world, I can't think of a nicer thing for someone to say. And in fact, scholars seem to be a bit divided as to what Claire had going. Was she some sort of voodoo practitioner with dark intent, or did she simply state the happy truth? In any case, after days of this, Paul had enough of Claire, and without so much as a health care proxy, he takes it upon himself to exorcise her, <laughs> robbing her of her gift, not to mention the revenue that she brought in to her owners. Not a way to make friends as the new kid in town. Not too long ago, up on Gannett Hill Road, in fact, it was just before Memorial Day weekend, a neighbor set up one of those little firewood stands where folks sell high-priced bundles of wood, in this case for fires to be uh, burned up in Ontario County Park. It's a neat little business, six bucks a bundle. But what I also noticed as I drove down the road is that the other firewood stand that had been just down the road a ways for a couple of years closed down. This road ain't big enough, <laughs> So that's something of the spirit maybe that Paul and Silas encountered as they were arrested, flogged, jailed, on trumped up charges of disturbing the peace. And all they wanted to do really was pray. But there's no disguising it. Paul had indeed meddled in something almost as sacred as religion, commerce. What's especially curious to me about the passage from Acts is that the roles keep shifting back and forth. Paul and Silas show up bearing the liberating gospel, but they're soon thrown into jail. And then some would say that Claire is imprisoned by a spirit of divination from which Paul straight away liberates her. And the jailer who tosses Paul and Silas behind bars soon finds himself imprisoned by fear once the earthquake sets the prisoners free, and the jailer's life isn't worth a plug nickel. As a collections officer in ancient Rome, the motto was, if they fly, you die. But roles change again when Paul, formerly known as the jailbird, becomes the great liberator to the jailer, offering him both the gift of life and faith. All this kind of reminds me of that old childhood game of tag. One minute you're the chaser, the next minute you're the chased. Tag, you're it. In real life, unlike tag, making that switch back and forth can be tough. It's pretty well known that for inmates, it can be very hard to make that transition from being inside to being outside. Almost as tough as it can be from being outside into the big house. We don't make those adjustments easily sometimes. Our shared faith story, the Christian story, has many high points, but one chapter that was not a high point were those dark days of high pressure conversions to Christ and the cultural arrogance that led some missionaries to stun all over indigenous peoples, all in the name of evangelism. The message was very clear at times. We're here to save you. You have nothing whatsoever to offer us. So maybe in that sense, with that awareness, Paul's early days in Europe may be a key lesson for us, for Paul, the lesson of humility. This was, after all, the same man who later on said, I do not understand what I do, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. That might have been refreshing to hear out of the mouths of some of those missionary forebears. Happily, Paul also said in another part of Scripture, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith that is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Maybe there's nothing quite like jail time and throw in an earthquake to 
will help us realize we're not all that, but God is. A bunch of years ago, probably 20 some, I hung out with a couple of dozen guys who may not have experienced a literal earthquake, but most had done time. And whether by earthquake or not, their lives had been rocked. They were living in a halfway house, a recovery house. And one key part of the therapeutic process was gathering for house meetings to talk about life together and life in recovery. And like the slave girl, they didn't hold back. Their motives weren't always totally pure, but their eyes were often very clear. And if somebody was heading for relapse, there's nobody better to catch it than another addict. Liberation comes from strange places sometimes. Hans Christian Andersen is famous for his story entitled The Emperor's New Clothes. And it took the honesty of a small child to announce the emperor was naked. The question, question to us then becomes, who were the little children, the annoying slave girls, the truth-telling drug addicts in my life who have the power to draw me back to God's truth, back to my God? Who are the unlikely liberators? Years ago, Art Linkletter brought us a whole lot of wisdom and a lot of laughs out of the mouths of babes. I'm sorry, I don't have one today. But even today, sometimes, the occasional children's moment, we may find ourselves deeply edified. Or if you're the parent, mortified. <laughs> Kids see stuff, and they say it. Paul and Silas and the anonymous jailer all did time in prison, but so did we. Prisons of fear, shame, regret, depression, anxiety, addiction. And it, at times it can feel like it's going to take our near an earthquake to free us. This wasn't the last time that Paul found himself behind bars. In fact, there are many indications that suggest his last days were in prison, during which time he penned some of what we now call sacred scripture. The very good news is that you can't keep God out of prison. In fact, it took a little time to think back and research just a bit about some of the literature that actually emanated from prison, in addition to Paul's. For example, Don Quixote, penned at least in part while Cervantes was in jail. Alexander Solzhenitsyn composed one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich in a Russian work camp. Martin Luther and King Jr.'s letters from Birmingham jail, and Anne Frank's diary, strictly not in prison, but certainly while she was hiding. A lot of good can come out of even moments of great captivity. Or sometimes we don't even know we're in prison. It's not always obvious. A writer by the name of Rosa Luxemburg once wrote this, those who do not move do not notice their chains. I thought that was a really neat one. Those who do not move do not notice their chains. And if you doubt this, try going to your first yoga class and see if you don't feel the chains that have accrued from not having moved enough. <laughs> but more seriously, chains often form in the presence of complacence. If we see a wrong and say nothing, the wrong can be ignored. And sadly, eventually, even accepted. Each time that happens, the bar gets lowered, like a limbo bar. And the next thing you know, the bar is on the ground. However, each time a courageous voice speaks up, the chains of injustice are dismantled one link at a time. 
and everybody's a bit freer. About 200 years ago, slaves sang some of the songs that we now sing in worship, including the one we're going to sing at the end of today's worship. Who knew that their tunes would one day speak to us, well-off white people living in the 21st century? But we all need God's liberating grace, all of us. We take our turns, sometimes we're the captives, sometimes we're the liberators, Sometimes maybe we're both at the same time, speaking words of freedom precisely as we struggle with our own bars and chains. Maybe having a known prison, we can offer compassion and freedom to others. I want to close with these words from Coretta Scott King about Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela sat in a South African prison for 27 years. He was nonviolent. He negotiated his way out of jail. His honor and suffering of 27 years in a South African prison is really ultimately what brought about the freedom of South Africa. May we all walk through the door of freedom, but may we also hold it open for others. Amen.